Yeah. Yeah. Good to go. Carry on. Start. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Mumbai branch of Indian Association of Physiotherapists, in collaboration with Arthroscopy Academy Mumbai, I, Dr. Ajita, welcome all to this webinar series. Till today, we had three webinar series. This is our last session of our last series that is on ankle, <coughs> sorry, ankle module, and the topics are importance of footwear in return to sports by Dr. Kushal Nath and end stage rehab, rehabilitation and return to sports after ankle sprain by Dr. Vaibhav Daga. Before I introduce our chairperson, a few instructions. First, please put off your uh, audio and video on mute mode. Secondly, we'll be having uh, question answer sessions after the first lecture. So whatever your queries are, please put them into the chat box. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce our chairperson for this session today, Dr. Ajit Dabulkar. He is professor and head of sports physiotherapy in School of Physiotherapy, DY Patil University, Nehru, Navi Mumbai. He is graduate from St. GS Medical College and postgraduate in musculoskeletal physiotherapy from TMC Mumbai. He has completed PhD from DY Patil University. He has more than 16 years of academic experience. He has 40 publications in peer-reviewed journal and book chapters in Springer. He is certified Mulligan practitioner, NDS certified, kinesio taping certified, trained in kinetic control, and certified yoga practitioner. Sport, he's sports physiotherapist for IPL, ISL, FIFA Under-17 World Cup, and World Drive so uh, Safety Series recently. So please wel help me welcome Dr. Ajit Dabolkar as the chairperson for this session today. Thank you. Thank you, Ajit Amman. Uh, shall I continue? Yeah. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kushal Nag. He is a renowned orthopedic consultant, presently working at Apollo Glen Eagles Hospital, Kolkata. He is a graduate from Kolkata Medical College and did his post-graduation from the State Medical College and KM Hospital. He is a fellow at the National University Hospital, Singapore, the Division of Foot and Ankle Surgery. He is a fellow at the Institute of Foot and Ankle Reconstruction, Baltimore, USA. He has many publications to his credit in the journals like Indian Journal of Surgery, Spine, Journal of Orthopedic Surgery, etc. Our speaker is a great debater and he has won many awards. The G.D. Goenka Memorial Award as in 2001 and Annual Medical College Foundation Day Debate Awards in 2002 and 3. He has interest put an ankle surgery with emphasis on sports injury, sports medicine, and ankle arthroscopy. It's a privilege to Dr. Nath that we have you as a distinguished speaker, and we welcome you. Uh, thank you, Ajit, for this uh, for this wonderful introduction, and uh, thank you all of you, uh, the Indian Academy of uh, Physiotherapists Mumbai, as well as the Arthroscopic Academy for taking this wonderful initiative of, of having a, a, a teaching module on ankle injuries, ankle uh, rehab, as well as, uh, you know, a choice of footwear. It's very important, you know, in a way. So um, with the permission of the chairperson, I would like to start uh, my uh, presentation. Yes. And uh, I'll share my screen now. Okay, so. Yeah, so I got it this way, okay. So just a, a few words before I start, I mean, um, before I go into the nuances of what type of shoes and what are the injuries that we look for, I'll start with a brief history of, uh, of footwear in, as we know it today in the modern uh, era and going back in history to figure out how and when footwear and, uh, you know, fashion intermingled and became one. So if you go back in history, this is the earliest archaeological evidence of footwear ever found, right? So um, 
From the evidence, we hypothesize that shoes were invented around the middle Paleolithic period, approximately 40,000 years ago. So the earliest prototype shoes were soft, made from wrap around leather and resembled either sandals or moccasins. So these were basically, uh, I would say, uh, foot wrap around, right? Then for hunter gatherers in the, in the okay. colder climates in Europe who had to run around and hunt prey. So they were Pushil, sorry for, to interrupt. Yeah? I think your PowerPoint is not visible to our screen. Um, okay. Anyone else who can't see this or? Ajit, are you able to hear the, see the screen? No, I'm not able to see. No, no one is able to see. Yeah, it's the downloads uh, folder which has been. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry. I think, I think the window has changed in the. Okay, I get it. So let me do unshare. And also, and you can uh, start the video also, sir. One second, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I think now you'll get my screen. Wait. Yeah, now you can see. Right? Yeah, now, perfect, sir. Perfect, sir. Okay, sorry. And also start your video also, sir. Your video can be non mode, right? You want me to not my video? Fine. Very good. I'll do that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you so much. I didn't know, sir. Thanks for pointing out. Anyway. Uh, okay. So this is the earliest prototype of uh, shoes ever invented, right? So you can make out the very simple rudimentary uh, leather structures to wrap around your feet when you're running around hunting. Uh, hunting game in the, in the wilderness of Europe, right? But then if you, uh, but then there's a big jump, you know, from the Roman era to the Middle Ages and to these shoes, which resemble like shoes, shoes which we are aware of, which we are comfortable with. So in the late Renaissance period near, in Europe, women and men's shoes were very similar. So if you look at this shoe, a gentleman and a lady would wear similar kind of shoes. The fashion materials and fashion would vary among social classes. Of course, the upper classes would wear something more expensive, while the lower classes would wear something more cheap. So, so for example, the common folk would, would wear heavy black leather heels, which were the norm for them. And for aristocrats and rich people, the same shape was crafted out of wood and maybe silk, if you are you're really a rich and a noble aristocrat in, in Italy at that time. But the styles were reasonably the same for both sexes. If you come to the industrial age in the middle 1800s in, in America and Europe, women's and men's shoes finally started becoming you know, start becoming different, right? They started to look different in style, color, heel and toe shape. So cloth top shoes made an appearance during this era and boots grew exceedingly popular. After much fluctuation, the standard for a man's heel finally settled at one inch. So today when you look at the common Oxfords and the brooches that you wear in, in Nevada or a Woodlands, the one inch heel is actually a legacy of 200 years ago when it finally settled at, at that particular length and length of the heel. But and in the late 19th century, that is up until 1890s and 1900s, shoes were made straight, meaning that there were no difference, difference between the left and the right shoes. So as the 20th century approached, shoemakers improved comfort by making the shoes foot specific. So now from the end of the 18th century, you had shoes which were uh, right sided and left sided. Up until then, up until even 100 years ago, you had shoes which could fit either feet. So funny, right? It's, it's only 100 years that, that this has happened. And in the 20th century, in the Great Depression, now you, now you can see shoes which you, which you start recognizing as something that we would be wearing in our daily lives, right? So during the Great Depression, black and brown shoes dominated the American market. And shortly after, Oxford became a popular male choice and cork sole platform shoes grew popular among females. So the men's shoe styles remain more or less same during uh, the following years, following World War II. Women's shoes made another dramatic alteration in their appearance. Women's shoes now were you know, more fashionable, they now are sophisticated, made to highlight the foot. So while the, the fashion in the men's era has remained more or less the same in the last hundred years, the female shoe has really, really, you know, uh, evolved to a, to a fashion accessory, if I may say so, right? So this is the history of uh, where we come from, right? And if you, and if I, may, if I may, may say this, modern shoes are killing your feet. And there's a good reason why I say that. They're messing up the perfectly balanced, coordinated bipedal gait that's, that our species has, has evolved over the last four million years, right? So ever since uh, we climbed down from the trees and started walking on our feet, it's been four million years. And that's over these years that our gait has absolutely balanced and evolved. Uh, that, that is changing. And it's very interesting if you can access this article in, 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 a, in the New York Magazine on health features. It's very, very informative and very, very uh, interesting. What, is the, what, what are the guiding principles of modern shoe design, right? When we talk about what, what shoes, to choose, uh, what shoes uh, we are choosing, uh, we must 
Give me a second, one, one second. Sorry. So what are the guiding principles of modern shoe design? Right? Uh, it hurts our, our heel if we, if, we, if we plant it too, 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 too fast on the ground, right? So shoes provide a structure to lift our heel and protect our heel. Walking on hard surfaces can be painful, so we wrap our feet in padding. People suffer from flat feet or fallen arches, so we wear shoes which have inbuilt arches, right? So these are the basic uh, principles of shoe design, modern shoe design rather. But most importantly, people like shoes that look nice. So even if it's uh, functionally a very, very uncomfortable you know, shoe, people will still wear it because it's now no longer a comfort thing, it's also fashion accessories. You'll see so many of those A-listers, the Hollywood guys, even you know the pop icons wearing shoes, which don't look like shoes at all. I mean, they're more likely you know, fashion accessories. And I'll tell you why this, this trend of shoes become, becoming more nice is not actually too nice for your feet. And there's a reason behind it. But since we are, today we're talking about athletic shoes, so how about a good pair of athletic shoes? By a good pair of athletic shoes, what would my patients or what would your patients think of? They will think of usually an expensive athletic shoe, right? Most people come and tell me, Doc, can I go and buy the Adidas shoe? I'm sure that's going to be very comfortable because it costs around 10,000 rupees, right? So that's the normal uh, reasoning. But this interesting article uh, published in 1991, which, which says wearers of expensive running shoes that are promoted as having additional features that protect, for example, more cushioning, pronation, correction, et cetera, et cetera, they're injured significantly more frequently than runners wearing inexpensive shoes. Which by inexpensive, they mean shoes costing less than $40. So there's a dichotomy here, there's a disconnect. And I'll tell you why this disconnect exists and what does science say. And in subsequent slides, I can explain better about where does science stand in this, in this argument between expensive, com apparently comfortable shoes and inexpensive, less comfortable shoes. So it's intuitive, right? If you, if you walk or run with no padding in your heels, it's murder, right? It's going to hurt. It's going to be terrible. You can't run on, you know, far on um, naked feet, right? But that's not currently true. The natural flexibility of your foot provides significant shock absorption. Wearing a big insulated shoe, when you walk, your foot hits the ground with a higher force. When you're barefoot, your body's natural neuromechanical feedback mechanisms can work to protect the rest of your extremities. You have much more sensory input than when you are insulated by a thick outsole. Which is, which is true. Remember, if you're running on a hard asphalt surface wearing a very thick padded shoe, you really don't feel where your foot lands, right? However, if you do the same with, on, on your naked feet, you will be much more careful, you will land, you will land much more carefully and you will be aware of where your foot hits. Is it a sharp surface? Is it a hard surface? Is it a rough surface? So there's a big, big qualitative difference between running barefoot and your foot protecting you rather than running, wearing a big expensive padded shoe where, there, where there's no natural uh, neuromechanical feedback. What about the arch support, right? This is a... Uh, Endless um, stream of uh, questions that I get from my, from my patients when they come to the clinic and they say, my arch has fallen off and I've got this nice shoe with the, with the arch. See, you see this uh, in the middle of the insole. But then I ask them, what is an arch? <laughs> arch is an is engineering, um, engineering principle, right? What is it? It's a, it's, so for the example, if you take the stone arch, so the stone has great compressive strength, but look at this uh, keystone, right? The keystone, which is a stone with a sloped side and it slides down in between the arch. So what it does, it allows the weight of the arch to be transmitted along its pillars. So if you notice, there's no weight coming down in this empty surface. The weight is coming down along the columns of the arches. And let me find an analogy to the foot for this. So an arch is a structure that is able to support weight over an open space by providing support at either end of that open space. So applying the same logic, the arches of the foot require support on either end of the arch, exactly the opposite of the type of arch support that is available currently in the market. These products attempt to support the arch, not by supporting the ends of the arch, but rather by lifting up the open space of the foot. And this does not make sense because if it's an arch, then it has to be the columns and not the middle empty space. So what happens that, uh, what happens now, we have those uh, products in the, uh, shoe stores. So true support of the arches of the foot mean the heel and the forefoot joints are the structures which should be supported and not the structures in between the ends of the arch. So if you just put a speed breaker in between in the middle of the insole or the middle of the footbed, it's not going to work. It's going to be very uncomfortable for the guy who is flat foot. And there's a good reason why you shouldn't be wearing this, wearing those uh, 
those arches in the middle of the foot. Pushing up the foot arch in the long run causes weakening of the muscles that span the open space of the arch, right? The intrinsic muscles of the foot, as well as the muscles in your lower leg, which send tendons into your final insertions, many of which are ending in the ends of the toes. For example, the flexor tendons of the foot, the flexor hallucis, the flexor digitorum, all these tendons span the ankle and the subtalar joint and end in the forefoot. So if you are going to wear a shoe which has a bump in the middle of the foot, in the long run, it's going to waste up with interesting muscles and cause your arch to fall flat over the years even more. And remember, um, in, in, in our practice, and of course in your practice also, you, you realize that individuals who have grown up barefoot, walking on soft surfaces like soil, sand, mud, have their foot arches function perfectly throughout the lifetimes. And their arches do not break down. You will never find a flat foot guy or a, or a, or a person with a hallux valgus or a crossover toe in a rural population. A farmer will never come to you with a flat foot because over the years, they've always used the natural arches of their foot they use the intrinsic muscles of their foot, hence their foot is not broken down. So it's, so as we humans march towards modernity, march towards a more urban lifestyle, we have started walking on artificial surfaces, which our foot have never evolved to do so over the last so many millions of years. So the human foot, which, which actually evolved over 4 million years, uh, during which majority of the time, the human race was walking on soft surfaces like, like sand, mud, soil, grass, it is only the last 200 years that we have started working on hard surfaces like asphalt, concrete, you know, hard tiles in those. And this has caused a fundamental change in the structure of our feet. So you realize that the foot, the, Indian, the, 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 the human foot now breaks down faster. The human foot breaks down much earlier. So now having flat-footed um, guys even in the 40s, in the 30s, which we never even had 50 years ago because at that time India was mostly a rural or a semi-urban population. But now that has changed. So now coming back to the topic of sports injuries, is there any evidence to support uh, that a bad shoe can lead to a um, lead to sports injuries? And apparently there is. If you if you look at you do a literature search, you realize that if you look at ACL injuries, right? There was a study uh, performed by Becker et al. We retrospectively reviewed a group of athletes with uh, acute non-traumatic ACL ruptures, arthroscopically proven, and compared them to a matched control group. These researchers found that excessive pronation of the foot and collapse of the arch during weight bearing in injured subjects. And they proposed that this is the mechanism, this is the mechanism injury. A flat-footed person with excessive pronation can lead to a non-traumatic ACL rupture in the long run. And so what is the mechanism? This is the hypothesis, right? So why does it happen? So they propose that arch collapse and excessive pronation leads to abnormal internal tibial torsion, which preloads the ACL. So an abnormal tibial rotation transmits excessive forces upward in the kinetic chain to the knee joint, producing medial knee stresses, force vector changes in the quadriceps muscle and lateral tracking of the patella. So, and, and, and it's intuitive, if you, if you, if you ever happen to uh, see, a, see a person with a very bad, bad flat foot, right? A person with a navicular drop of more than maybe a centimeter, these guys are, will usually come and complain about calf muscle pain. Sometimes they'll complain of knee pain and often even back pain. And it's intuitive if you realize that once your foot goes into valgus and turns out, your knee, hip, and back will also try to compensate to maintain the center of gravity of the body. So it's not a surprise that this study you know, is saying that a pronated foot can actually cause knee injuries. Achilles tendon disorder, another very, very common injury which, you, which I find among my uh, patients who are either amateur or professional athletes. So the Achilles tendon inserts on the calcaneus and, it's, and the insertion is just medial to the axis of the subtalar joint, making the calf muscles some of the most powerful supinators of the subtalar joint. So therefore, when there's excessive pronation, eventually the tendon, tendon undergoes overuse degeneration and inflammation. So how does that happen? So when you pronate, right, it generates an obligatory internal rotation of the tibia, which tends to draw the Achilles tendon medially. So high-speed cinematography has shown that pronation produces a whipping action or a boosting effect in the Achilles tendon. And this contributes to micro tears in the tendon, particularly in its medial aspect, and initiates an inflammatory response. So all of these studies have been published in reputed journals over a period of years. And we have noted that athletes or high performance athletes, either amateur or professionals who are playing at a very high level, if they have any foot deformities, and if they don't get it corrected, they will end up having more injuries as they start playing and as their career progresses. And I'm sure there are many, many athletes who have had their careers cut short or had their careers marred by injuries because nobody picked up a pronated foot or maybe a high arched foot that they had, which caused problems in their professional lives. So now this begs the question, right? 
So now we know that people with uh, foot deformities or rather athletes with foot deformities should get their foot deformities corrected. That's a no brainer, right? We know, all know that. So how do you get it corrected? So before we get it corrected, we have to know what the problem is, right? Many of us, in fact, all of us here are clinicians who understand and who see and who know what a pronated foot looks like, what a caver's foot looks like. But that may not be the case in every, uh, every corner of the country, may not be the case for every uh, physio in even a small town or even, a, you know, or even in big cities. So the big problem is how do you identify it? And even if I identify it, and I'm sure all of us here, we can take a look at the foot and tell them it's a pronated foot. What is the treatment for it? So is it a footwear or a footbed modification or what is it? The, what is the way forward? And if it is a footwear or a footbed modification, what modification and what amount, right? The qualitative and the quantitative part also is something that we know nothing about. So if I have to correct a pronated foot and give it the correct hind foot um, valgus correction, how much of angulation do you need to put in the footbed or in the footwear so that it gets corrected? That's an open question. We don't know that. So what we usually do, we send it to our um, orthotic uh, colleagues and they do an eyeballing and they, you know, and they do something about it. But then I think this needs to be better addressed. And I think today the technology exists in India and in the world that this can be addressed in a much more scientific manner. But just to uh, give you a small overview of the types of problems that, that we usually face in young people and I assume we're talking about young athletes uh, playing professional sport. Your plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendinitis, flexible flat foot, sometimes cavus foot, hallux valgus and Alex valgus is becoming very, very common in the younger population now. Sisamoditis and metatarsalgia, may, which may or may not be a result of an injury while they are playing sports, right? So these are the uh, common subset of injuries you find in an um, athlete. So how can we identify these issues easily? And can technology help us do this better? So there are two points to this question, identification and treatment. So how can we do it fast, repetitively, and how can we be corrected every time, right? How can we preserve the quality of the diagnosis and how can technology help us do this better? So what I have been trying to do over the last um, one, one and a half years, I've been uh, using this uh, AI-driven advanced diagnostic platform. So what it does, it, it does a biomechanical analysis. It identifies the clinical condition based on a foot scan and patient input. It recommends a shoe or a footbed modification and helps us in designing the modification within the footbed. So, the question that how much of pronation correction or how much of hind foot algas you need to correct is answered by this um, the, by this machine. And I, I find it very interesting and very uh, helpful for my patients because as a clinician, even I have no idea how much of uh, valgus correction I need to give to the hind foot to correct a flat foot. So what does this do? So it asks a few questions to the, to the, to the um, athlete or the patient when he comes. And these are the pain points which are there in the, in the machine which tells you uh, please mark your pain points, right? So you can mark out a pain point here or here, wherever. That's a medial view. This also has the bottom view. Remember, this is the bottom view where you're seeing. This is the heel. This is the midfoot area, the, uh, the great toe and the lesser toe area, right? So once the marking, the pain point marking is made, a foot scan is done. A foot scan, the laser foot scan is done and this is thrown up. This report is thrown up, right? If you look at this uh, report carefully, you realize that on the right-hand side is something called an arch index. On the arch index, you have an uh, uh, index of 0.28 on the left and 0.29 on the, on the right, which means that he has moderate flat foot. So once I know that someone has a moderate flat foot, now I need to tell him that you have moderate flat foot. Now you need to correct the shoes or the footbed that you uh, wear. I personally believe that correcting the footbed is far easier because you, that footbed can slip into any sports shoes that that person wears and it doesn't interfere with his choice of brand or his choice of fashion for that matter. So once this report is generated, the next thing comes is the, the program will tell you that you have mild flat foot. And if you happen to tick on one of the pain points, they will tell you we have plantar fasciitis or systematitis, whatever pain points that you tick on. So this forms the crux and the basis of the, of the report, which is, which is generated. And I validate the report because I also look at what the report is throwing up. So I am I, a second check of the report because I see the patient also. And once that is done, the, the program recommends the orthotics that you need to wear. So these orthotics are generic orthotics, which you can wear according to your, uh, your uh, choice or your, your fashion sense. And they're all, made, they're, all made, they're all custom built for the person because every individual has a different amount of pronation correction or a different amount of arch raise that needs to be done, especially for those high performance athletes. So what happens is once the, this the one the scan is done right so once the scan and the patient uh, data is captured by the by the ai uh, engine 
it goes into the cloud, right? And the cloud, what the cloud does, it has a smart, smart algo and analytics engine, which detects a food condition and recommends the product. By product, I mean the orthotic, right? And not only does it do it, it also captures enough information to tell you that your foot is 10 degrees pronated and you need to correct it by five degrees so that it comes within the normal range of zero to five in a normal individual. So what happens is it also throws up a 3D, uh, 3D image of the foot. And this 3D image is the one on which uh, the mirror orthotic is made, you know, depending on how much of correction is required. And on the right side, you will see the different corrections that can be done by uh, either an orthotic or a graphics designer or a physiotherapist or even by someone like me, right? Anyone can do it. It's very intuitive and you can do it. And once this designing is done, you can figure out this is how it looks like. So you have both your feet uh, mirrored on the orthotic and this orthotic is manufactured depending on what foot condition you have, how much of correction is required. And this is a... Uh, 3D model of the orthotic that's going to be manufactured. And once this designing is done with the corrections inbuilt into the system, it is very precise, even to the degree. So if you want five degrees of correction, it will give you five degrees of correction. There's no eyeballing. There is no uh, approximation involved in this system. So once this is done, so what happens is once the designing is done in the back end by whoever is designing it, it is 3D printed. So the, the uh, design that you see, the shell that you see is nylon. It's 3D printed nylon, which is quite hard. And the same thing is very flexible. I find this to be very useful for my, for my athletic patients because they're very um, high, high intensity athletes. They're running, jumping, playing badminton, they're playing table tennis, playing TT. So they take a lot of these, a lot of wear and sheer stress on the, on the material. And this is very hard and at the same time, very flexible. So once this is done, it looks something like this, right? You can have different designs on it depending on how much flexibility the, the athlete requires. So if he's a, a runner, I would prefer the left hand this model because there's, there are less stress risers in this design rather than the right side. On the right side, you have a lot of hexagonal pods there. So these pods, even though increases the chances of stress breakage, they give you a lot of flexibility. So someone who is a badminton player, someone who is a table tennis player, who requires a lot of flexibility, he will wear something like this. So you can tailor it. The design can be tailored according to the uh, sport that the person is playing, according to the deformity that the person has. So it, it is really very helpful for me. If I have to, someone has a plantar fasciitis, I can give a deep heel cup or heel of loading. If someone has samurai or metatarsalgy, I can give a metatarsal bar. I can stick a top layer on the on this. So this looks like this. So this is the finished product, right? So the shell is the one which is 3D printed, and this is the entire top layer, which is which can be different types depending on whether you have any four foot problems, whether you have any callosities, whether you have any any, any pawns, whether you have any metatarsalgia. This can be tailored to give you extra cushioning in the four foot. And as you look at it, this is very uh, thin profile. It is. 2 mm to 2.5 mm thick. So this goes into any sports shoes of choice of the uh, athlete. So you're not, I'm not interfering with uh, the type of shoes which he's wearing. And even if I did, there are not too many shoes in the market uh, which has excellent, uh, uh, you know, customized um, footwear design. So even if I ask him to go and buy a Nike or Adidas, he will most likely be buying a generic shoe with, which doesn't have the exact um, contours for correction of his deformity. So with this, I have slowly moved away from doing the manual uh, assessment and the manual, uh, you know, the manual sticking up, sticking up those uh, materials on the insole. And I find this is very nice and very good for my patients, giving us very good results for my high, high performance athletes. And um, to answer the question that we started out with, so I believe, yes, we need to modify uh, shoe wear for our athletes who are playing at a very high level, but I think it's not the shoe is rather the surface on which the foot rests, which is the foot bed or the insole, in other words, which needs to be modified so that we can correct deformities and prevent um, uh, injuries in the long run so that our athlete uh, patients can have a long and happy, successful career. So thank you so much for uh, giving me um, this time and opportunity. I would be happy to take any questions from now. That was an excellent presentation and a great insight about how the footwear should be. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. A uh, few questions. Uh, I don't. Let's see which are. Okay. Can you tell us how uh, often do you, in sports mm -hmm. there will be a life for the uh, shoes? Correct. 
Yeah. So how often? How how do you make out uh, what is the time that we have to change the shoes, or you know, it, it is still in the final shape. Yeah. So. Um, for someone who has a normally aligned foot, right? Doesn't have yes, any flat foot yes, or any other deformities. So usually I ask them to change, change the foot beds rather now. I don't ask them to change shoes unless it's absolutely torn. At okay. least every six months because these guys are playing at a very high level. Yes. Over a period of time, they will wear and tear on the foot beds and they will start breaking or you know start tearing. So I think six months is a, is a good enough time depending on if you are a high level player or even you are an amateur sportsman also. And uh, can you suggest uh, gender-wise or age-wise differences in the footwear? Uh, no, not really. No, let's not look at... A, uh, a sports person of uh, 25 years and a sports person of uh, maybe 40, 45. So, depending so, upon so, the sports yeah. also, but really. gender-wise and age-wise. So, uh, um, as is age, right, your foot starts breaking down. And, and I, as I mentioned, yes. as you start walking more and more on hard surfaces, our foot will start breaking down faster. So if you are someone in the mid 40s and you are a sports person, you're most likely to have a foot deformity. So for them, I think it is far, far more important to wear a comfortable shoe. Don't go after the price of the shoe. Price of the shoe is not a good determinant of how comfortable it is. Wear a comfortable mm -hmm. shoes, wear a shoe which is, which can, or wear a footbed which can correct your deformity so that you can give your feet more longevity in a way, right? So it doesn't break down faster. And if you're a young person, of course you can wear any shoe you want. If you have deformity, less likely to be unless and until um, it runs in your families. As in flat foot is very common in, in, your, in your siblings and your parents. So if you have deformities, please wear a corrected uh, insole within a shoe. And another important thing, wear the correct type of shoe. So don't play basketball wearing a running shoe, right? A basketball yeah. shoe is a high ankle shoe. Uh, yeah. If you're going to play basketball with a running shoe, you'll get injured far more quickly than otherwise. So, these small nuances, uh, don't play soccer without a spike, right? Otherwise, you'll fall injure yourself. So, um, buy the right shoe. If you have deformity, get the deformity corrected. I think that should be the key takeaway. Uh, there are a few questions here. Uh, what is the price range? And what they mean by that? Price range of shoes is up to you. I mean, maybe depending on... <laughs> Any suggestions on foots? I think Ajita, they are asking the price range of that equipment. Oh, that one. Okay. Ah. So I think, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I, uh, okay, I think that starts from around uh, five and a half thousand and goes up to seven thousand. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what are the uh, what are your recommendations for non-athlete having flat, uh, flat feet who are asymptomatic? So for asymptomatic, I have no recommendation. I only treat people when they come to me with a problem, right? So if a person comes to me with asymptomatic flat feet, I will tell them, wash out, take care of your feet, but I will not necessarily intervene unless he has pain. If he has pain and he is a flexible flat feet, I will still give him the orthotics that I showed here. And there are different types of orthotics of different price ranges. So whatever the affordability is, I would usually prefer a custom orthotic because that gives him optimum uh, pain relief. But painless flat feet, I won't intervene. Because there are a lot many orthopedic shoes coming into uh, market. So, does will it make a difference or no. give a dynamic stability to the, uh, the here, uh, It's about what's in a name, right? So, there are lots of Dr. Ortho slippers and shoes. Yes, yes. And there are lots of doctor shoes in the market. There's nothing doctor about it. It's just that, that the name is there. So, there's no science behind it. So, if you're actually looking for science, you have to get a custom insole made for a person who has a painful or a person who has discomfort in a flat foot. That will give him the best bang for his buck. Even if he's spending 5,000 rupees, he's going to get relief for the next one year, right? Instead of buying five shoes for 10,000 rupees, which doesn't work. I don't think that's the way forward. True, that's very nice. Uh, any recommendation for footwear for plantar fasciitis with high R? Ah, very good question. So, uh, Halus valgus and right exten um, extension tendons. Right? Right e extensor tendons. Okay, tight no, no, extensor tendons. Tight. Tight extensor tendons. Tight, tight. Oh, okay, tight. Okay. So, um, I, so, let's take the first question. Very interesting question, by the way. You know, gave us foot. So, people will don't come to you with a high arched foot people will come to you with two problems. One is plantar fasciitis and peroneal tendinitis. 
Yes. So if I if I close my eyes and if someone comes and tells me I have perineal tendinitis, I will say most likely you have cavus foot. I mean that's the that's a no brainer. So a person with a cavus foot will come with pain for perineal tendinitis and pain because of plantar fasciitis. And there are two ways to treat it. So if you have cavus foot, by the way, so obviously you need to correct the the supinated hind foot by giving custom orthotics, which can add a add a um, lateral wedge, which will cause more valgus. But if it's a um, but if it's plantar fasciitis, there are two things I do to treat it. One is stretches. So this is plantar fascia stretches and you guys know more about it than I do. And offloading. So I give a custom insole for offloading the heel when they're walking and stretches. So I tell him the offloading is for symptomatic relief to tide him over the next six months when you're walking and the stretches is actually for the cure. Because I want you to stretch out the tight fascia so that it causes less pain at this insertion site. For tight extensor tendons, I'm not sure what tendons I'm talking about, but I think stretches is the way to be. If it, I think if it's tight gastrox that you mean, you have to stretch it out. There's really no way out of it. But there's an interesting point. If you ever... Extensor digitorum brevis tendons are tight. Oh, then... Tight extensor digitorum brevis tendons. So is there a neuromuscular reason for it? Because otherwise... No, no. They are just tight because of the little clawing along with the... You know, there's a little clawing along with yeah, the yeah. cavus and a hallus valgus. So, you also has cavus, right? Yes. Is the cavus a flexible cavus? It's from, it's from birth. Yeah, so that's, they have a high arch foot from yeah. birth. So there is a syndromic association there. So if it's congenital with a cavus with tight extensor tendon, there is some sort of syndromic association going on there because very unlikely you will have a tight EDB, right? And they usually have clawing. When they walk, they will claw and their toe tips will have uh, corns and painful calluses. So I think uh, I recommend you to stretch it out, but I'm not sure how successful you will be. A congenital uh, a deformity like this is not very amenable to, uh, to uh, conservative therapy. So usually these patients end up getting surgeries done to correct the cavus foot by doing a calcaneal osteotomy and maybe a releases of the EDB tendons. But of course, stretching, you can always start. There's no harm in doing it. Sir, uh, can you highlight on footwear for different uh, sports? Okay, so... Uh, Recommended for different sports. Yeah, so very simple uh, examples like basketball shoes, right? They have high ankle shoes. So if you, are, if you are a basketball player, wear high ankle shoes. If you are a runner, wear shoes which are, you know, which have a lot of neuromechanical feedback coming back to your feet, especially if you are a cross-country runner. So if you're, you'll see there's something called white grams, right? There are those uh, uh, shoes which don't look like shoes, look like gloves for your feet, right? The white grams. So the, the idea behind the white grams is the vibrams give a lot of neuromechanical feedback so that you can uh, grip better, you can feel better. So if you're a cross-country runner, you'll notice all those Kenyan athletes who run, they don't wear very padded shoes. They usually wear good shoes, but very flexible um, uh, insoles. So they can grab the, grab the soft ground on which they're running. If you are a runner on an asphalt or a, or a sprinter, right, you will wear shoes which are also flexible, but which also gives you a lot of uh, mobility. No, don't wear heavy shoes when you're running. That, that's not a yes. way to go. So yeah, that means uh, modifications in your footwear can help enhance the performance. Of course it does. Of course, of course. What are your uh, opinions on the new air shoes of Nike? <laughs> I, really don't have the rest? <laughs> I really don't have an opinion. I think, I think the shoe uh, industry is moving around the wrong direction. I think they're moving around. So the innovations which are happening, right? It's happening more on materials and design play. I put air in your shoes. I put gel in your shoes. None of them talk about uh, correcting deformity. None of them talk about correcting the plantar pressure distribution, which is what it should be, right? I mean, they, we should the pro mechanics. promotional yeah. gimmicks. Because they are, they are intellectually bankrupt. They don't have any uh, science behind the shoes they're making. It's just more... Uh, you know, more fluffy, more soft, more Michael Jordan, this, certain things like that. There's no science behind it. So, if you're a fan of Nike, please wear it, but I wouldn't. There's one question. Any specific proximal deformity which should be taken care of by correcting a symptomatic pronated foot? What do you mean by proximal deformity? As in proximal in the... As you come, uh, yeah, like... Yeah. Uh, me or so it's the other way around right it's the other way around so if you have so um, there was this study that we tried to do on uh, people who had uh, knee arthritis varus right so so if you have a and you and if you and if you are doing physiotherapy or you're following patients with a knee replacement right you notice before the knee replacements they have a varus knee and a valgus foot 
after the knee replacement, they will have a nice looking straight knee, but they will have the valgus even more. So these yes. patients will come and tell me after they have visited my colleague uh, who has done the knee replacement, come and tell me, doc, before the surgery, I could walk. After the surgery, my knee is absolutely fine. Fantastic surgery, but my foot hurts. So what has happened is over the years, to compensate for the knee virus, the foot has gone into valgus. So without correcting the valgus, either by a modified shoe wear or an insole or something else, they have corrected the virus knee in one setting and then they can't walk. So there's a huge bearing of the kinetic change from the foot to the knee to the hip. So if you are treating yes. the knee, look at the foot and vice versa. And so that the, the logic is correct the distal jump most joint first. So if you are going for a knee placement in a person who has a bad flat foot, please correct the flat foot first. It may not be a surgery, it may just be a shoe modification, but please get corrected first. Otherwise, patient ka expectations, jo hota hai, patient expectation is after the knee, I am fine, I'll run, but then they don't. So you have to, I mean, temper their, temper their expectations by saying, oh, God, you have a foot deformity, this has to be taken care of for you to enjoy the benefit of a knee replacement. Uh, I think we'll take uh, one last question. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned initially that the arch for support causes intrinsic muscle weakness. But uh, in hyperpronation, uh, the correction shown, there was an arch support. So can you just explain? No. So, yeah, excellent question. So I'll tell you that. So uh, uh, if you have a foot skeleton, right? Uh, I don't have it here. Sorry, I have shown you. If you can pronate a foot skeleton, you'll realize that the arch hits the ground, right? And if you look back, you'll see the heel has pronated. So it's the hind foot valgus. The hind foot goes into valgus. So if you can just hold that calcaneum and neutralize it and at the same time hold the metatarsal head to prevent it from going into compensatory supination, you will realize the arch automatically appears. You don't need to put anything up to make the arch appear. So once your arch has appeared, it is a supporting system for the arch. So it is not only an arch support. And only arch support is the problem. So if it's a heel wedging, a, a medial wedging to correct the pronation with a slight heel with a slight arch raise, which corresponds to the native arch. Remember, when you when we do a foot scan, we scan both the foot in a sitting position as well as in a weight bearing position, and we always mirror the sitting position arch. We don't give them an absolutely normal arch as per textbooks because they will not be able to take it. So give them a small amount of arch, but that's not the primary correction. The primary correction is the medial wedging in the hind foot. You are just putting up a small uh, elevated uh, part to support the arch. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the questions will definitely continue because it was such an enlightening uh, lecture and uh, really we learned a lot uh, because of time limit and we have another speaker. Sure, sure, please. Uh. Questions, we'll just post it and so that you can... Sure, I'll answer it at my, that. At my leisure. No thank you, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Thank you so much. Over to you, uh, Dr. Ajit. I think Dr. Kushal is uh, leaving uh, the session. So I think Ajit, we can uh, thank him uh, for being here. And then continue with the speakers. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kushal, That's for right. your enlightening talk on uh, the foot, uh, foot orthosis and uh, the use of artificial intelligence in foot scanning. And it's, you know, I was uh, thrilled by how the product comes to out with an algorithm. So I think that was great. And uh, thank, we thank you again for having you. Have a good evening, sir. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. Thank you, sir. I have to leave it to pick up my son. Sorry. Um, right now, no. me and my wife are taking turns walking and <laughs> doing domestic uh, shows, right? So it was a pleasure having uh, being here with all you guys. My, uh, my second home in away, Mumbai. So I would have loved to be there, but next time maybe. Thanks, Dr. Nath. It was very nice, very informative. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll introduce the next speaker. Uh, our, our second speaker needs no introduction. He is, uh, by, he is Dr. Vaibhav Daga, who is a head sports and science and rehab consultant at the uh, Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital. He has 20 years of experience in his field. He's a graduate from University of Pune and a postgraduate from University of Bath, UK. He holds also a diploma in advanced orthopedic manual therapy. He has been awarded best physio at the ATP Enclave 2015 
and in the same year he has been awarded as a young achiever award he has been um, as a sports physio in india and abroad he has been in he has been as a physiotherapist for in bcci delhi daredevils former team physiotherapist in india a team india under 19 team women cricket team former team physio at the mumbai cricket academy pune warriors uttar pradesh cricket association maharashtra cricket association we are fortunate and privileged to have the next speaker dr vaibhav daga over to you thank you so much good evening everybody uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction ajit uh, and thank you mumbai branch uh, indian association of physiotherapists for having me uh, tumare ma'am and everybody thank you so much for this opportunity so right as well let me just start my screen share just a second Yeah. Okay. So I'm here to start. Uh, basically, talk about uh, ankle injuries. Yesterday, I mean, day before yesterday, um, it was Nikhil uh, uh, who spoke about uh, ankle injuries, ankle sprains, and the initial rehab. Uh, it was nice of him. Uh, he put light on it. Of course, the assessment of ankle was covered by Dr. Anta. So today, I'm here to speak about uh, the later stage, the end stage of rehab, and how do you return to sport after an ankle sprain? So. uh going ahead basically when it when you talk about ankle uh, it's basically one of the former american football players calvin johnson uh he said if any time you are dealing with an ankle you've got to run you've got to cut you've got to do all those kind of things it makes it tough i mean it is definitely a, a it's the most distal joint which is taking all the load um and it has got lot to do in sport for sure so the vulnerability of an injury to the ankle is very uh, very very high in um, in this session i basically would like to uh, introduce give you give a certain introduction about what exactly uh, uh, the the incidence the prevalence the epidemiology um management wise uh, in the even in the acute phase of or a sub acute phase management what are the latest evidence um then treatment uh, how how the treatments differ in different phases of healing um with i talk about some late stage exercises and uh, then we definitely think about the return to play or the return to sport decision decision making and how, how the exercises can be progressed to, uh, towards that so as you see uh, there are 2 million acute ankle sprains occur each year only in the united states alone i mean we only have data about united states and abroad regarding the injuries in sports uh, as you can see football is one of the uh, one of the fearsome sports where uh, where ankle can be easily injured and it's uh, it's 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 pretty high there uh, the incidence of an ankle injury so the it's it's also a most common injury in athletic population and accounts for up to 30% of sports injuries according to a study uh, the ankle is the most common injury joint in sport requires to accommodate as i said variety of surfaces maintain propulsion allow direction change without altering it demands unerring strength balance and flexibility very important for this ankle to have all these kind of qualities so that it can sustain the loads of the sport or the um, or the uh, loading so uh, as you see the incidence the the reports that according to a study by the nca which is the national collegiate athletic association uh they study they conducted a study a large study actually throughout the us state there uh, where women's gymnastics cross country uh, women's cross country women's soccer and men's cross country were found to have the highest incidence rates of ankle sprains or ankle injuries the prevalence of foot and ankle injury is large in ncaa as i said division 1 athletics program was 27% of total musculoskeletal injuries uh, over a two year period with 21% of these injuries resulting in missed time um 
they, I mean, according to that study, the foot and ankle injury incidence rates were more missed time in female athletes and women's sport. If you go further and talk about the epidemiology, the most frequently occurring foot and ankle injury in the same study were the ankle ligament injuries, tendinopathies, fasciopathies, and bone stress injuries. So a, a lateral ankle sprain is frequently incurred musculoskeletal injury with a high prevalence among general population and individuals who participate basically in sport. So it's, uh, it's, it has a very high frequency. So let's talk about football. I mean, uh, yeah, my focus on this in this talk is uh, because there's a lot of research about ankle injuries in football, and I'm going to talk about football. And football is this is a, is a is a global sport which everybody follows, uh, which everybody looks into. Um, as somebody like uh, Harry Kane, uh, who has got who has been in trouble for his ankle for the last two three years, he's been missing games. So as you see. Statics, statistics show that uh, between 2 and 9.4 football players suffer an injury uh, to their feet per 1,000 hours of exposure. In international football, 11 to 23% of all injuries are recorded during FIFA competitions. Ankle injuries are recorded in FIFA competitions. The rate of ankle injuries in lower-level amateur athletes, children, and adolescents is higher, still representing 35% of all injuries. Further in football, it says ankle injuries are nowadays the fourth most common injury type in elite football. If you talk about only football injuries, in, in the latest studies have shown that uh, it's the fourth most common injury. And they are preceded by uh, knee, the thigh, and the lower leg before the ankle. So it's, it's about the lower limb. I mean, it's, it is no brainer that because it's football, it is going to be lower limb. Practically, that a professional 25-player team can expect approximately seven ankle injuries per season. So, almost one third. I mean, almost if you if you talk about one third, a little bit, little bit lesser, a uh, little bit uh, lesser than one third um, uh, of the team suffer ankle injuries per season. Uh, six six to 24 calendar days of loss of every ankle sprain, and in severe cases, it goes up to 28 days of approximate losing. Uh, of game time. In elite football, the ankle sprain represents 10 to 70% of all related ankle injuries. So, if we go further and talk about the lateral, uh, lateral ligament sprain, 40% of all the traumatic ankle injuries occur during sport. For indoor sports, there is seven lateral ankle sprain per thousand exposures. Uh, despite the high prevalence and incidence, uh, the lateral ankle sprain injuries, it has been reported that only approximately 50% individual who incur a last uh, uh, LAS, which is the lateral ankle sprain, seek medical attention. Not many of them, not everybody of them seek medical attention because definitely it is, it is a, a, a joint which gets injured, but the, the healing capability is also good. But somebody who doesn't do the proper rehab possibly lands up with some kind of an issue ahead. A large proportion of individuals who sustain LAS will develop chronic ankle instability. That's what I was saying. I mean, if somebody who doesn't, who doesn't really uh, focus on the rehab or focus on the healing phases and respects the injury will definitely uh, suffer with uh, chronic ankle instability. Um, um, there was a study done, basically a video analysis was done and to see the re exact mechanism, what exactly happens, how does uh, uh, a footballer sustain an ankle injury. So there was a latest study which showed impact by an opponent on the medial aspect of the lower leg just before or at foot strike resulting in lateral directed force causing the, causing, causing the footballer to land with an ankle in a vul vul vulnerable inverted position. So that's that's how it, it happens. I mean, it was st studied over a period of time uh, on various footballers uh, for around uh, seven to ten years uh, in this study. Forced plantar flexion when the injured footballer hits the foot of the opponent when attempting to shoot on the goal or clear the ball um, act, uh, is is how these mechanisms are there. On an MRI study, it revealed commonly injured ligaments were the ATFL and the CFL. 41% and 5% had PTFL injuries only. So that was the brief introduction and what uh, the injury looks like. I mean, we basically, uh, uh, you have covered, um, uh, yesterday, Nikhil covered a lot of uh, initial uh, treatment and rehab. I'm going to talk about a complete management. So uh, basically, to uh, because the management has to be proper, a grading system was created basically to get uh, the guiding to the treatment of all lateral ligament injuries. So as you know, there was grade one, grade two, and grade three. 
my uh, so my grade one is mild and where you don't have uh, a lot of uh, swelling or inflammation or the uh, or, or the discoloration as you can see in the picture also that's how the grade one injury is grade two is a little bit moderate there are uh, much more fibers of the ligaments which are injured and grade three is of course complete lap rupture uh, the joint capsule can be injured so there will be a lot of uh, trauma around that ankle joint in a grade three severe uh, sprain. So uh, the treatment of lateral ligament tears uh, basically is based on three phases of biological ligament healing. Um, like uh, as everybody knows that there are three phases, the inflammatory phase, the proliferation phase and the remodeling of the maturation phase. Basically the initial inflammatory phase lasts up to four to six days. Um, and from there onwards, uh, there are some, there's some overlapping uh, of the next phase, which is the proliferation phase, where basically the healing starts, the fibroblasts, um, as you know, at the, at the microscopic level, if you see the fibroblasts uh, start regenerating and uh, there was, there's a uh, healing and regeneration which is starting to occur. And of course, the maturation and the re remodeling phase is the longest phase, which can up to take uh, one to two years. Um, so if, if you talk about the management, initial management, um, if uh, in, into the inflammatory phase, there are uh, a few things which we need to look into, and I would uh, I would put stress onto the, what are the latest evidence uh, regarding because we know that an acute and inflammatory response, everybody wants to rise it, price it, police it, or uh, these days peace and love, or uh, what is the new acronym which is being followed. Uh, then there is uh, NSAIDs which will you which which uh, doctors and orthopedic surgeons do uh, prescribe for the for the pain and control uh, and the inflammation uh, there is a theory about immobilization uh, so we're just going to take a look at one by one if you talk about the rice or the icing what we do rice is a conservative treatment uh, which method that has been rigorously investigated and the efficacy of this combination uh, uh, this combination is is questionable at the moment. So uh, it is, uh, the, according to the latest study, the three currently randomized controlled trials conducted showed limited available, available evidence of efficacy of cryotherapy for reducing uh, acute uh, lateral ankle sprain injury associated symptoms. Um, it, the increased evidence indicates that the individual aspects of rice are are not, are not that effective apart from cryotherapy provided with a combination of exercise therapy if it is given it the results are much more better uh, and the healing is much more better and, and the response is much more better if it is combined with exercise therapy it's not only about uh, just doing the eyes but a, a certain movement so for that's for that's that's the thing i mean there comes uh, uh, that's why the synonym from rise to price it has moved to police and now it is uh, it is called to peace and love so basically you you need to have a protection of that particular injured part rest it out you have to have optimal loading for it so ensure that the loading is not that much that the it is going to damage the injury further so these are the various things and so that's why we try start uh, the range of motion exercises or probably some isometric exercises which is not going to stress the joint but rest of course as Nikhil described in his uh, uh, in his talk yesterday, rest is definitely a lot important. Resting that particular part and resting that particular range of motion where the ankle is, uh, the ligament is getting stressed is more important. Uh, that's why it has to be, um, so only eyes is not the way ahead. Uh, NSAIDs uh, versus placebo. NSAIDs have been, may have, may be used by patients who are incurred uh, acute uh, lateral ankle sprain for the primary purpose of reducing pain and swelling. However, uh, it has to be taken care that the associated uh, usage, its usage is associated with complications and may suppress the delay and the natural healing process. So uh, these days they say the anti-inflammatory uh, medicines which are given are kind of um, uh, hampering the natural healing process of the soft tissue. That's why it is not recommended. Definitely in the muscular, uh, muscular injuries, uh, in my experience, even when I was with different teams and uh, when, when I was the first contact medical and I had to uh, use for a muscular injury, which is very common in the sport, um, we, I avoided uh, giving any kind of uh, an NSAID or prescribing which was in consultation with the doctor and it was basically said to give a lot of uh, only for the pain if, if the pain is too much, uh, a painkiller. 
and Al Jazeera. Immobilization versus the functional support. Uh, so what is the latest on that? Uh, use of functional support and exercise therapy is preferred as it provides better outcomes compared with only immobilization, which was a preferred way uh, in initially for any ankle sprain. If immobilization is applied uh, to treat pain and edema, yes, it, ha it can be applied, but it should be maximum for uh, 10 days after which functional treatment should be commenced at the earliest. Uh, when we talk about functional support, functional supports is in, uh, I mean, we talk about immobilization and when they, then we talk about functional support. Functional support is the most important thing because it will, it will give you the support, it will give you the compression to the, uh, to the initial uh, phase, but, um, but it will allow the movement according to, uh, into the pain-free range or optimal way of uh, doing that. So, so functional supports from the, uh, so the treatment with any type of a real ankle support was more effective compared with treatment with less adequate support such as compressive bandage or a tubic grip. So something like these taping, like the dynamic tapes or the kinesio tapes or the rigid tapes would be a good functional support. Uh, most of it, this dynamic biomechanical tape is pretty useful uh, in regaining the function. So it will help as a functional support. Manual mobilization, uh, there's a very good place for the manual mobilization. Findings in previous studies show that manual mobilization only results in short-term effects. Current evidence shows added value of manual mobilization when used in combination with the exercise therapy will give you long-term results. A combination with other treatment modalities such as exercise therapy enhances the efficacy of the manual joint mobilization and it is advised hence. Um, looking at the exercise therapy, the new evidence has become available uh, on the specific effects of different types of exercise and rehabilitation programs, especially the beneficial effect of exercise therapy on preventing the recent sprains, reducing the risk of functional instability, and expediating the recovery of an ankle joint function. That is what uh, is required for an earlier return to sport and a proper return to sport. Uh, the exercise therapy should be commenced after lateral ankle sprain to optimize recovery and of the joint functionality. So when we, when, we, when we see that excess therapy is there, what would be the goals for the late stage rehab? Of course, the late stage rehab, you have to, from the earlier phases where you said, you start with some isometric exercises, range of motion exercises for the ankle. Here, uh, the, the goal is to improve the strength, enhance the proprioception, which you definitely would have started in that early stage. Uh, to improve the neuromuscular control, um, that is the proprioception, which which of course uh, would be lost because, as you know, because of the injuries and the mechano injury to the uh, ligament, which has the mechanoreceptors, progress to the functional exercises, simulate the physical demands of respective sport like jumping, turning, and twisting should be initiated in this stage, um, increasing the load progressively, and we plan for the return to sport. So progressive exercises, as you can see, uh, these are the various exercises uh, which are recommended, like the eversion strengthening, as you can see in the first picture here, uh, you can do it bilaterally, but when you do it bilaterally in a sitting position, it's, it's a little like a functional position, it's more focused on to the uh, hip joint. So that's why it is recommended to do a single, uh, single leg one, uh, eversion strengthening, for the, for the, I mean, the perennial strengthening. Similarly, um, you can do a perennial strengthening in such a way that it is a little bit in plantar flexion because the most vulnerable uh, ankle uh, the position for the ankle to get injured is, of course, plantar flexion and inversion. So you want to strengthen the perennials. You can basically keep a soft foam pad below the heel so the, the ankle stays in plantar flexion and you just do a rare foot um, kind of moving the rear foot in as he was showing in the video, uh, which will strengthen the peroneal muscles. So this is, this is a very functional way of strengthening uh, the, the peroneals to, uh, to have a good lateral ligament uh, stability, uh, of lateral ankle stability, which will improve. Then, uh, of course, functionally, weight-bearing exercises could be started with just an ankle band pull. And you, if you can possibly try and focus going on to the toes. Again, a lot, of, uh, a lot of activity can happen on the peroneals 
um, in that particular position. If you, if I go back the video there, uh, he's trying to initially. You can stand on on the foot and the heel both, but after that, if you can progress to standing on the toes with a little bit of plant flexion, which is going to help further the peroneals to strengthen uh, properly in a functional way. And this is the, the vulnerable position, basically. So if you can strengthen them in that position, it is recommended to do that. Um, in, in a study uh, way back in 1996, wobble bowl training for 12 weeks, starting one week after an acute ankle sprain would reduce the chance of re-injury by the 50%. See, the most, uh, the, the most important thing in an ankle ligament sprain, uh, uh, lateral ankle sprain or ankle ligament sprain as you call it, uh, is that uh, there is a high chances of re uh, chances of re Sorry. Is that... Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, okay. Continue. I thought somebody was asking a question in between. No, so, uh, take the questions later. All right, all right, okay. So, uh, so, 12, so as, as I said, 12 weeks starting in the after one week of an acute ankle sprain gives you great results uh, for the um, chances to reduce the chances of re-injury by 50%. Uh, so reducing the re-injury rate is the most important thing when we talk about returning from an ankle sprain. Uh, so if, if I move this video ahead, uh, you will see this is how they do the wobble board exercises uh, with support. And of course, uh, after that, you do it without support on a double leg first and then, then on a single leg with support and a single leg without support to give you that instability work uh, and a little bit of proprioception, of course, not a little bit of very much of proprioception and a neuromuscular work which happens through this uh, wobble board exercising. Similarly, uh, as you as you move ahead, you need to be way, getting into the dynamic ankle stability. You can use a bosu ball, uh, like a bosu ball is you know a bottoms uh, bottoms of the, the side up. Uh, you basically do it with the different ways, um, going back and forth, uh, then going medial laterally, I mean, throwing a lateral hop onto the bosu ball, then progressing it to a single leg hop onto the bosu ball before we really start doing a single leg hop on the, on the floor, because these are the exercises, because this is the stresses, what the ankle will go through when you're, when you're doing certain activities in a sport, which is like twisting, turning, jumping, and the ankle, uh, once it is pain-free, the criteria is basically, of course, there should not be any pain in these kind of exercises, or we have to check before progressing to these exercises, clinically, the pain should have been better on a regional analog scale, which will help us to progress accordingly. Of course, clinically, there should be no pain on palpation also, uh, which will help us to progress that, and it will make the ankle ready for the uh, for the stresses ahead in in every sport, which will require the ankle a lot as being the most distal joint. Uh, similarly, uh, there are other exercises which can be more functional based. Uh, if you see, you're talking about standing on uh, one leg and doing a Y balance sort of an exercise. Uh, this can be done if if you have a Y balance equipment. That's very good. If you don't have, still you can possibly do it just by arranging a few dumbbells or a cones around you and reaching for them so that uh, the ankle ha knows about the stress, stresses, what is put. It will take you through very functional loads. Um, if you, as you're going anteriorly, you're going posteriorly, um, there is a posterior loading which is happening. Um, there's a posterior lateral loading which is happening. There's a posterior medial loading which is happening. I mean, this is lateral and the other one is medial. So these kind of uh, uh, exercises are very important. Similarly, you can combine it with, uh, with a forward, uh, forward lunge and a sideways lunge onto the bosu ball to get more effect on the ankle and the instability um, of, of the surface, which will help uh, to strengthen it. Then uh, there is another exercise which uh, which has been found in my in uh, for me in my uh, practical experience or in my practice till now is of strengthening of the soleus muscle, which basically is you. Uh, this is a very functional strengthening of the soleus muscle, which is also helping the ankle stability. As we talked about uh, the strengthening um, yesterday, even Nikhil mentioned about the calf strengthening and the calf uh, muscle uh, conditioning. 
So this is how it is. The soleus. There are two parts of the um, two parts of the uh, uh, gastrocnemius and soleus. So this is the good way to functionally strengthen the soleus. Um, so you basically go uh, raise onto your heel, go into a squat, and raise back tall up by taking some kind of a support in front of you. Uh, if you lose balance, just for that, he is using that one. So these are the various kind of exercises which will help uh, for the ankle to, to look forward about the demands. You can do very sport specific stuff on a wedge. Uh, we can start with a, with a ball play on this. Possibly if, you, if it's a footballer, he possibly can start kicking with the other side, uh, stabilizing on the injured ankle, um, may, uh, putting the stresses because uh, and also after that, kicking on the same leg, depending on what kind of, which leg is his dominant kicking leg accordingly. So, uh, so when, you, when, you're, when you're returning to sport, basically uh, for any return to sport, usually you go through these stages. You, you check on the status of anatomic and functional healing. You check on the status of recovery from that acute illness and associated sequel, what has been happening if the proliferation phase is uh, crossed and uh, you're coming into the remodeling phase. Um, so status of the chronic injury and this, this, this rule of checking everything about a return to sport for every kind of a return to sport. It is not only about ankle, what I'm talking about. Restoration of the sport specific skills, skills, psychosocial readiness, ability to perform safely with equipment, modification, bracing and orthosis and compliance with applicable uh, all of the rules. Uh, this is basically uh, body, governing body regulations so that you are not causing any harm to your fellow players also. So uh, going further, when we talk about return to sport from an ankle, lateral uh, ankle sprain, there is definitely no formal criteria available for the decision making currently um, in the literature. We don't have any uh, formal Questionnaires. Uh, there are a few questionnaires which have been recommended, but still they are very not very uh, conclusive. That this is the, this is the, they are the best ones, which I will talk about it later. Um, there are what you talk about is basically uh, so decision making is basically multifactorial. It has to be it has to be very uh, you, you have to check on the functional limitations. Example, the range of motion and the strength to the pre-injury levels. Your cardiovascular fitness has to be to the pre-injury levels. Uh, no apprehension that should be there in the athlete or even uh, the multidisciplinary team which is looking after the athlete like the physiotherapist or ourselves or, or the strength and conditioning people or the, or the coaches who, who think they, that they are, not, uh, they are not apprehensive about the athlete to come back to the sport because they feel that he's still not ready. So, it, uh, so apprehension has to be on, in, 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 on the both sides of the table. Uh, has to be there. We should be no apprehension at all. Um, then the, pin, then um, the latest study shows that performance function tests like the, uh, like the ankle dorsiflexion range of motion, simple single leg balance to more complex tests, uh, you have to see on those kind of tests and see if it is almost uh, at the 90%. If you check about this, uh, this is basically what you're doing is a, is a dorsiflexion lunge test. Um, you're basically keeping your toes um, I mean, you're keeping a tape measure there, you're trying to touch the knee to the wall and you compare it to the other side, to the injured side and the other side. And if there is a not less than 10% difference, uh, uh, if it is a more than 10% difference, of course, the return to sport can be delayed. But if it is under 10%, then yes, you can go ahead. So basically, uh, the injured leg has to be at least 90% of the capacity uh, from the uh, of the uninjured leg. So that, so that uh, it will give us some objective measures to evaluate the readiness to the return to sport. So as I said, the dorsiflexion lunge range of motion, then a simple single leg balance test, going on to uh, standing heel rise test, as you do single leg heel raises, perform unilateral heel raises with a fully extended knee. Uh, you've got to count repetitions uh, until you're able to complete due to pain or fatigue. Um, it is in this uh, video. It is suggesting 25 repetitions, but the but the paper which came out for the per performance function testing, they're talking about 50 repetitions till fatigue. And uh, if if they can reach that, they would be ready to get onto the field 
and put a uh, progressive load. Then um, complex tests like the star ex excursion balance test, where uh, you mark the star excursion balance uh, 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 way, and you basically touch your feet in different directions, as you see in the front, uh, 45 degrees, 90 degrees to the lateral side, I mean, to the medial side, posterior medial, posteriorly, going to posterior lateral, I mean, in an oblique direction there, diagonally, pure posterior lateral, and then anterior lateral. So all directions are covered, and this test can be used as treatment, of course, uh, for before returning to sport, and also as an evaluation tool. You probably can mark the distances uh, of the uninjured leg. I mean, you compare it with the uninjured leg again, as I said, and uh, if they are close to 90% of the capacity, then you are uh, good to go ahead uh, for the return to sport. Similarly, Y-Balance test, these days you get this Y-Balance equipment, uh, Y-Balance board, which is already present. You can use that as a uh, test and you again do the same measurements. You do anterior, posterior medial and posterior lateral on every leg, on, on a single leg, and you uh, me measure the distances accordingly. And then check about check about those and compare it to the uninjured side, and and then we take a decision again if it is 90% as I told you before. Um, then goes there are other tests like the single hip, single leg hop side to side test. Um, it's basically you uh, keep apply two tapes 40 centimeters apart and you do a side to side hop on the injured and the uninjured leg. Um, so if, if the difference is not too much, like for example, this gentleman who's doing is, is basically Mick Hughes, who is a great researcher on the ACL injuries. Uh, this test can be used in the ACL return to sport also. Um, this is basically, and also ankle ligament injuries. So um, he's basically trying to see, compare it with the right to the left. The right he did around 47 jumps uh, till he felt fatigued or pain. And on the left, he could manage 36. So accordingly, if the comparison is not more than, there's not much of a 10, not much, not, there's no difference of more than 10%, then that particular ankle is ready to undergo more stresses, uh, functional stresses, which can be uh, progressively increased uh, for the return to sport. Similarly, there are other tests like the front to back hop test, functional hop test, 180 degrees rotational jump, these are, the, these are the other functional tests, uh, performance function tests, which have been uh, said to test any lower limb injury uh, would be good enough to progress uh, onto a return to sport way for the physical performance ways. Then you basically progress to very sport specific agility stuff where you basically do a T test agility uh, one where you again look for the timing. If you have an initial data, it's good. Uh, otherwise, you look for pain um, and any discomfort while doing, considering this. This, uh, this person uh, at the moment is doing it very slowly, but it has to be pretty, pretty quick because it is an agility test and the speed has to be maintained. So that's how it is. And if you talk about, uh, uh, I would further add up on the return to sport exercise routine. You basically have to check into the routine. If you go uh, initially start with the warm-up of walking, some uh, stretching so that you're properly warm up. Ensure when you're returning the athlete to be um, to stressing the physical demands of that particular sport, um, you have to ensure that the all muscles are ready for that. And accordingly, you start with some straight line running initially. 45 degree cutting, sort of zigzag running as we call it. Very important. So from running to lateral cutting, then you do the figure of eight running, which is which involves a lot of turning again uh, on uh, in both ways on both the sides, ensuring uh, that there is no pain 
or an issue in the ankle while you're doing that. Then you start with some squat jumps, which will make you ready for the ankle, the impact on the ankle. From the double leg squat jumps, you progress on to you progress on to single leg hops uh, from the side to side, and further on progress on to complex hops, front and back hops, uh, rotational hops, or similar to the testing. If you train them uh, accordingly, you'll get written. Uh, the return to sport will be pretty much. Uh, Easy. As I said, uh, patient reported outcome measures and functional performance tests are recommended in, in, the, in the study, which was done in the National Athletic Tennis Association position statement during the return to play process. So uh, the, there, are, there were a few questionnaires. Of course, the visual analytic pain scale is for the pain, but the, the CAIT, the, uh, the identification of functional ankle instability and the kinesophobia, which is a psychometric test for the fear of, uh, of, the, of the instability. Uh, so these are the various questionnaires which you, which you would find out um, would have stood out in the recent studies. And this can be given to the athletes before uh, you can make a decision of getting them back to uh, the sport and progressing them to the sport. Um, I would just Put a word on the uh, lateral ankle uh, surgery about the surgery versus conservative and the lateral ankle sprains. Um, uh, despite a clinical, uh, good clinical out outcomes of surgery after both chronic injuries and acute complete lateral ligament ruptures, functional treatment is still the preferred method as not all patients require surgical treatment. It is, it is, it is, I mean, I'm sure uh, Dr. Anta also mentioned in his, in his talk yesterday that uh, the go-to Go to way is conservative treatment of exercise and rehabilitation, uh, and to get the sportsman back as soon as possible uh, with with the best way possible with the very evidence based exercises. What we saw in the late stage rehab using the questionnaires that is the best way to go ahead. This also helps to avoid unnecessary exposure to invasive treatment and unnecessary risk of complications. However, treatment decisions have to be made on an individual basis. But if he's an athlete, if he's if he's a if he's a football player, uh, if he's and he needs to ensure a quicker return to play, possibly that's where the surgical intervention would be necessary. Thank you. That was all about, and there was the references what I used for this talk. Um, thank you so much about this. Uh, yes. Thank you, Vaibhav. That was a very enriching talk and I would like to um, highlight about certain things in your lecture mm -hmm. that is the emphasis on conservative management and surgery only with respect to uh, early return to play. Um, also said that it's important to work on the healing time frames and the need for evidence-based practices in ankle sprain. You also reinforced uh, many things like uh, the simple use of wobble board, stability trainer, bosu ball for dynamic balance training. Uh, you mentioned about uh, calf muscle conditioning and specific sports specific exercises along with um, uh, modifications like bracing and orthosis. You mentioned certain um, the return to play criteria and the various the importance of performance functional test and uh, the importance of different hop test and the different uses of return to play exercise routine and you gave a wonderful tools for return to sport which are primarily related to the patient reported outcome measures i think the audience need to um, you know keep um, these things into mind to make the patient, uh, you know, make your documentation, give a more documentation of evidence-based practices and document their progress through these outcomes. Thank you. Thank you once again. And it was a delight to have you again. My pleasure. Thank you. Over to you. Yeah, thanks. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Just 
a uh, few questions yeah sure that we can take a few people uh, sports people are more prone to injuries ankle injuries like uh, because of the anatomy you can say right so mm -hmm. uh, uh, who are the people uh, you think will be more prone to ankle injuries and what is there any uh, prophylactic therapy that you give to prevent uh, ankle injuries uh, there there has been there has been a lot of studies going on about uh, doing a prophylactic uh, neuromuscular balance training uh, to avoid these ankle injuries uh, in various sports it has been it, it has been conducted and uh, mostly if you sport if you see a sport like football rugby uh, where it's it's uh, it's a lot of running and twisting and turning. These are the uh, in these uh, they have started doing some preventive exercises like uh, you can use the programs like the FIFA 11 Plus program, which is which is a great tool for uh, prevention of an exercise uh, prevention of an injury. It has been successfully dealt with in women's ACL prevention, uh, which the study has come out of late. Possibly the similar can be done uh, that, that kind of a warm up drill or it can be used as a warm up drill. If I learn plus, then there are there are other there's a there's a handball study there's a handball uh, guideline protocol uh, which is there. So there, there are various uh, exercise programs which could be used as prophylactic measures, uh, and uh, we can try to improve their neuromuscular uh, balance and their proprioception, which possibly would avoid um, the the injury. But even if if they do and um, and suppose uh, there is an injury. The return to sport time, possibly because the neuromuscular condition and the pathways are developed, would be much more uh, easier and better, I would say. Thank you. Um, cases of uh, splaying of feet, uh -huh. do, you, do you give any prevention? Uh, I mean, splaying of, uh, that was a question which was asked to Dr. Nag. I, I, I yes. saw that question. Yes, but, uh, but uh, do we do anything differently? I don't. Uh, I according to me, uh, because that's a natural thing. I mean, uh, we're talking about the splaying of the feet. Uh, it's a natural thing. You didn't. Uh, you don't really do anything. Of course, if if he if he has a static uh, a pronated feet or something, possibly, and if it is symptomatic, if it is asymptomatic, I don't think so. I'll do anything to it. I would basically possibly work again because because of the splaying of the feet. If there is any possibility of an ankle sprain or any kind of an ankle ligament injury ahead, I would possibly give him the prophylactic measures of the exercises. What I answered in the last question similar kind of thing but i don't think so uh, i think i would do anything because i've seen a lot of fast bowlers having a foot fly uh, when they when they are bowling uh, on their uh, on their non bowling leg and so uh, we haven't done much to it i mean that's their natural way and suppose if we correct their performance decreases so i don't want to do the uh, get off their natural stuff which is happening and it is unless and until it is symptomatic i won't do anything to it okay and uh, similarly for the flat foot you, are you similarly for the flat foot? Similar, yeah. If it is asymptomatic, that's asymptomatic. You don't I, I, would, I wouldn't intervene at all if it is asymptomatic. Do I, you work on the intrinsics for it? Um, possibly, but uh, there's not a great evidence on that. Uh, he, uh, the intrinsics are going to really regenerate your arches. Uh, but yes. Uh, but you can try, but definitely I would say if it is asymptomatic, leave it the way it is and let them possibly work on the proximal joints, proximal strengthening, uh, like the hip strengthening, the knee strengthening, uh, the core strengthening, uh, which will help in turn the functionality in sport. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, do you work differently for the anterior uh, and post uh, versus posterior aspect of the ankle? Or as a whole, do you take it as a whole? Similarly, lateral and uh, medial, or you work as a whole? For uh, that? I mean, at this stage of rehabilitation, it will be worked mostly as a whole ankle because it's the whole ankle which is going to be in the picture. Of course, initial rehab when we start, um, it is of course very specific. And as we get to a return to sport phase or a late stage rehab, where the whole ankle has to be taken into consideration, not only the whole ankle, as I said, of course, uh, the working on the proximal kinetic proximal, chain, yeah. kinetic chain has already, st we start the work in the early phase itself. 
from the acute to subacute and then develop it into uh, this return late stage to return to sport thank you so much uh, dr vaiva Pleasure. So there are no more questions in the chat box that we can refer to. It was an excellent presentation and we got a lot of uh, insight into the ankle. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Uh, I would do something to Vaibhav. Can you yeah. hear me? Hello. Yes, yes sir. Can I can. Can you do something? Yes, Vaibhav, sir. I have seen you right from student days. Yes, sir. To, to NCA and yes, now. Sir. I am so happy with you. You have progressed so well. Your hard work, dedication, sustained efforts, sir. and ability to learn new new things and implement in your patient and not giving up easily. I admire you and congratulate and keep it up, Vibhav. Thank you thank very you. much. Sir. Really happy for you. Sir, you are doing, right. doing good job. Inspired from seniors like you, sir. Sorry, thank you so much. Congratulations. Good very good presentation. Very very informative presentation, Vibhav. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Lot of information. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. A lot of practical tips. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we need to get as practical as possible, actually. A hey, good job. Oh, you have done very well. Very well presented. Yes. Very well presented. Okay. I enjoyed it also so much. I never left the screen for a minute. You know. Thank you, ma'am. That's my honor, ma'am. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you all. going or to you uh, ravi uh, yes uh, thank you ajita so i am here to propose after a very enlightening session of uh, both the, the day before yesterday and this session was also to uh, enlighten first of all as of for today's webinar i would like to thank dr ajit for uh, uh, accepting our invitation to chair this session and you did a wonderful job thank you very much ajit from mumbai branch and uh, i ravindran as treasurer of mumbai branch uh, i'm here on behalf of my ec entire executive committee of mumbai branch of indian association of physiotherapists to propose the vote of thanks of this particular webinar series so this webinar series started on 23rd may and today is around 24 june so it was an extensive almost a month long webinar series we had almost uh, total 9 days of webinars which has three modules shoulder rehabilitation spine module and ankle module so we had a total of around 15 lectures delivered by 15 eminent speakers and specialists in their own respective fields there were four panelists who were there in a panel discussion on a low back pain so this was really a extensive work done put up by the back end team which includes our ec as well as our academic uh, committee which is there dr dipti dr bharti dr maria ma'am and their team who had really worked for more than more number of uh, hours than us and uh, next i would like to thank our partners arthroscopy academy this is the second time we are uh, collaborating with them uh, and it has been a wonderful last year also we had an extensive uh, conference at uh, this time we had a very extensive webinar series they have given us their technical support uh, for for zoom platform and uh, streaming live of all these series of which the members are taking the advantage of this so i would like to thank the arthroscopy academy mumbai for supporting us and collaborating with us this time around and uh, the my biggest gratitude to all the speakers and the panelists for bringing in their experience expertise ex and their expertise into the table and also engaging in fruitful constructive and open exchanges throughout this webinar series we had an excellent discussion in this field of sports rehabilitation is concerned a big thank you from mumbai branch to all the speakers who are and the panelists who have uh, joined us in this webinar series and hoping to be uh, many more associations with you people again in future also a big thanks to all the chairpersons for accepting our invi invitations in spite of uh, technical issues the um, uh, lockdown issues timing issues all these things they have been very uh, supportive to us whoever we have been approached and chairing the sessions in a very professional way so that uh, we acknowledge that because of the speakers and the chairpersons a lot of ground has been covered in this field of physiotherapy and sports rehab is concerned and i think the members will also acknowledge the same and a big uh, congratulations i would say to our easy team to pulling off this webinar series with a very good uh, rapo in spite of all the difficulties it this would not have been possible without the able support and guidance by our convener dr maria ma'am 
our advisors, Dr. Deepak Achalia and Sailesh Shadi sir, who've been professionally support uh, behind us in whatever endeavors we are trying to take. So it is a congratulations to all you guys. And uh, there are no words for me to, uh, uh, no words, words will be adequate to tell my gratitude towards our members. They've always been so supportive, sweet, in whatever fresh ideas we bring in to give back to them in professional, they've always, always been sub supportive by attending them in large numbers. And today also we are more than 50 plus in Zoom and some following in Facebook as well. So I think we've gone from uh, citywide to a nation, national wide uh, audiences. Now there are audiences from outside uh, Mumbai also been attending these webinars. Now the technology is allowing us to. So I would like to uh, uh, thank them and uh, always keep motivating us in such so that we can give more, much more uh, uh, professional uh, 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 series for you people. And uh, we promise that the endeavors will continue in future uh, from Mumbai branch of association. Once again, I thank each and every one of you for supporting us uh, in this endeavor. Thank you all. Uh, work safe and stay safe. A special thanks to Ravi, our director of webinar. A wonderful thanks, job. Sir. Wonderful the sir. host, the host it's of our been a, webinar. It's always host been a team effort. Director, every water is a technical director, host, moderator, and man of all seasons, and backup man for any problem. And uh, congrats to you, Ravi. I, we are really happy uh, that you are doing a wonderful job for the committee. Thank you very much, sir. It's always been a team. We have a very good team at Mumbai branch. Uh, which is dynamic, I would say. Definitely. Thank you all once again. Thank you very okay. much. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ivan. Thank, thank you, Ajit. Thank yeah. you, Ajita. Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ajit. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.